So my topic today is going to be HR analytics uh, at Swiss Re. So I'm going to give a, a brief introduction to Swiss Re first, uh, a little bit about myself, how I got into Tableau, and then I've got two key topics that I want to talk about. First one is visual design and how we use some of the principles of visual design within our, within our dashboards. And I've got quite a few examples to show, so hopefully for all those people that work in HR, uh, hopefully you can get some good ideas. Just a quick show of hands who works in HR. Anybody? That's quite a few. And then the second part is around training. So how do we actually go about training our team within Swiss Re to use Tableau and get more skills within that? First of all, a quick intro to Swiss Re. So does everybody know what Swiss Re do? Anybody? So it's basically an insurance company. Uh, the re part is reinsurance, and that's the main focus of Swiss Re. So they actually insure the insurers, which to be honest, I didn't even know existed a few years ago. But that's what they do. And so there's a lot of uh, risk management involved in what they do. It's a global company. Uh, there's around 14,000 people all across the globe. And I've only been there for about nine months now. So relatively um, not that long time. So prior to that, I'd been at UBS for a long time, also in HR. So I've got quite a bit of experience within HR analytics and the types of metrics that we use. And you'll see quite a few examples uh, within, that, within the presentation. So a little bit about, about myself. You probably, I've lived in Switzerland now for about 19 years, but obviously you can probably tell I'm not Swiss. Uh, I am from Manchester, so I will try to speak clearly make sure I'm understood. Uh, and how did I get into Tableau? So it was probably about three or four years ago. Uh, I wanted to do something different. I'm a very visual person. My main hobby is photography. So I was looking for different products. What, what could I do? I was always in data and, and uh, analytics, but I wanted something different. And I saw Tableau. And at the time, I also had a business question from, from one of the senior leaders. He, he was thinking that I had this view that people were leaving and coming back as contractors and earning more money. And he wanted to know if that was, was true or not. So we had the data, although that was maybe the, the trickiest part, getting the data. And I was quite amazed at the, the speed in which I could actually, from downloading Tableau for the first time, to be a, being able to create a dashboard and answer the, not only answer the question, but do it visually, do it interactively, so that we can drill down the organization. And at the same time, I could then sell that to our management within HR to actually start using Tableau within HR at UBS. They've been using it ever since. There's a few colleagues here today. And, uh, and I've been using it ever since as well. And uh, I think it's a great tool. So if I get onto the, the main focus now today, the visual design is the first topic. Before I get into anything around actual design and, and principles and ideas of what makes a good, good uh, dashboard, I think this is the, the first thing that you always need to focus on, the focus on the question. Make sure that you're answering the question of whatever the business is asking. If you don't do that, it doesn't matter how nice it looks, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is, it's kind of irrelevant. And so when I'm thinking of this topic, I've always got one question in mind, and it's why. Very often I'll have, uh, the business will come and they'll say, for example, can I have a list of all headcount for last year? So why? First question is why? Now it could be that they don't know. They've just been asked to get this information as well, so they have to go back to whoever asked them. Or maybe they do know and they say, well, we want, all, we want to know all levers from last year. Can anybody guess my second question? Why? So then they say, well, we want to know if there's a relation between levers and bonus being paid out. So that's an actual proper question. Then you know, you know the data, and then by the fact that I just keep asking why, you can then actually produce a valid visual. Now, I could have just given the, the line by line in the very beginning, in the first phase. But for one, that's kind of boring for me, and it kind of doesn't really help them. 
so this idea of constantly asking why to try and figure out what, what is the real point of the, the question not only helps, helps them, but it also helps me design a better visual. So I just want to put that there first. I think it's key, regardless of how nice it looks, this one needs to be answered first. So then when it comes to visual design, now I've, I've seen plenty of the presentations over the last two days myself, and there's been lots of talk on this, and they've gone, you can talk for this for hours, I guess. But there's three elements that I think are, are key, and these are the elements that we use within our dashboards as well. So I just want to quickly go through these. And the first one is storytelling. And I know that's another buzzword that you very often hear, but I think it is important to, to, to build a narrative around a number. Now, earlier on, I, I did mention that the headcount of Swishery is about 14,000. Now, normally, if somebody says a number like that to me, I would just go, so? It doesn't actually mean anything. It's just a number. You don't know if it's big or small. You don't know if it's, uh, how it's in relation to the competitors or, or anything. It's just a number. So the idea of being able to tell a, a narrative around that headcount of 14,000, maybe where it came from, where it was a few years ago, where it is today, and how do you do that? You break it out by maybe geography or... Uh, uh, organization or rank or something to give the idea of what it is today, how that 14,000 is made up and maybe where it's going to go in the future. So do you project it to go up or down or whatever. The next one focused on a few rather than many points. I've had examples of, of in both cases throughout my career and one that I had uh, in my previous job was a team came up and said, well, we've got 28 metrics, can we have a dashboard? So my next question was, why? Uh, so many metrics, it's very difficult to actually make. First of all, making a, a, a dashboard or one pager with 28 metrics is going to be very difficult. Secondly, it's just going to be too crowded. And thirdly, what are you going to do with it? It's very difficult to actually manage, look after, look in, into the process of those 28 metrics and do anything about it. So why do you want so many? On the other hand, I, had a, I worked with a senior guy that he focused on three a year, which meant he had time to actually go into them, figure out where, where the process issues maybe were failing, and actually do something about it. And he was very successful. The other team were less so. So I think it's important to always just focus on a few. It makes it a lot clearer. It makes the visual a lot better when you, when you get to that point, And it just it makes it easier. And simpler. And the last part of context. Context is everything when it comes to data, I think. Being able to add that extra piece of information to give a bit more information, whether it's a, a trend line or whether it's uh, a benchmark number. For example, with, with Swiss Re, 14,000 is Swiss Re's headcount. Our main competitor of Munich Re is around 45,000. So it's quite a big difference. So those three, the key things of what I would say when you're talking about storytelling. And once you've got that, you can then obviously start planning the, how you're going to design it, which is the bit that I like the most. The actual design and the formatting, how you can actually sell this data to your, to your clients. So the next one I've put is layout or design. Now the first one is my favorite, white space. Uh, you'll see with all of my slides, there's plenty of white space. And it's the easiest one to do because you don't have to do anything. You just leave it. But I think it's the one that adds most value to most dashboards or reports. And I think it should be used more in, in certainly many of cases that I've seen. And if you don't go away with anything else today, I think white space is the, the key message that I would like to get across. So I think it's, it's so useful when designing a dashboard. Now the next one, and as I said, I've been on talks in the last few days. You can go into a lot of detail in this section, but these are the things that I think are the, the key, key ones. So keep the dashboard clean and concise. A simple example there is with axes. I tend to get rid of axes all the time. It, there are exceptions. If you're looking at time, then it usually helps. But in most cases, I will try and get rid of the axis. 
but I will obviously put the label within the chart and I will make sure that the title is detailed enough that you know what you're looking at. But it, it loses the clutter from within that graph. It's very difficult anyway, I think, to look across uh, an axis and figure out what the number is on, on, on such a small screen. So I tend to get rid of them and make it just a general cleaner uh, view. Then you've got text and icons. Uh, Swishery, we have our own font, Swishery font. So uh, that's the one we have to use. But just be consistent, I think. Uh, always use the same text, or the same font, I mean. I generally use three different sizes, one for the title, one for subheadings, and one for everything else. Icons, obviously you can see there's three there. It just makes it a little bit more livelier than just having words all over the page. And obviously you can see what the meaning of those Hopefully you can identify what the next one's going to be. Uh, but it just makes it a little bit easier to read. People are visual by nature, and it's a lot easier to, to read a picture than it is words, or it's just quicker. And the last part, I think, is also important. And I, I hear cases uh, for and against this bit, but I think selling your data is very important. We're not always writing reports for people that actually like data or are interested in it. They want to be able to just get the message out of it. And if you can sell it in a way that people think is, oh, this is, wow, this is quite uh, attractive, or this is different, I haven't seen this before, then that always helps. And so if you can use a Sankey diagram, or if you can use a, a, a waffle chart or something else, so long as it answers the question and you're not just doing it for the sake of it, then I would still recommend trying to do that. And we, I generally try and use these in every dashboard that I do. Every time I go out, I'm always trying to be consistent with the look and feel, with the, the logo, with the name of our team. It's on every single one. And it builds up this professional look and feel that, that, uh, that people be, uh, eventually come to trust. So my final one, can anyone guess what it is? Call her. So I said white space is, is probably the most important one uh, for just letting your data breathe. I think color is the one that allows everybody to focus on what you actually want them to focus on. Now again at Swishery we've got uh, our standard palette which we, we have to use. This is, uh, this is called Lake and I think they paid a lot of money for this. But uh, I tend to use color limitedly or in a limited way. So I tend to use one, maybe two colors, or I'd say I'll use uh, shades of the same color. Now you've got to be careful, obviously, with colors. There's been plenty of talk on colors as well over the past few, few days. And you've got the issues of, of uh, color blindness and social connotations of green and red usually mean danger or good. And you just have to take those into account when you're actually using color. So that's the actual theory side. So how does that relate to the dashboards that we create? So I've got a few examples now. I didn't pick the color. That, was a, that is one of our standard colors, and that was, was there when I got there. So I'll, I'll just go through the, the dashboard itself. I've been there nine months. This is a, what I was given to do. My first three months, that was there. Uh, they needed a workforce dashboard. So everything related to headcount, whether it's uh, active employees, joiners, leavers, voluntary, and so on. And we wanted to get away from just providing line by lines or going to the source system. We wanted something that was interactive that would allow the people to delve down into the data and get a lot more out of it. And as you see, I've had to uh, blur a lot of the numbers. It is all test data, and everything that I show in the next few slides is also test data, but I was still asked to blur the, some of the numbers because of the nature of the data, except for the headcount, you can see. So some of the ideas of the principles of what I've used, I was talking about color. Obviously, the bulk of the color is on the left. That's where I want you to look first. We've got six key metrics on that page, starting with the active headcount. And the white, the little white uh, the box, that's the, the mouse over. So that's, we make sure we format the mouse over. And you can see there's a, the year-on-year -year value. 
So we want to add some context straight away so it's not just a number. We've already added some extra piece of information. And you know if it's going up or down, the little icon as well. There. Now, ordinarily, I wouldn't have that bar across the top with big purple. But the platform that we put this on is called, we have an internal platform called Information One, which is where all of the key uh, dashboards reside. And that was one of their uh, restrictions, or that's one of their things that they wanted. They want everything to have this cent uh, central heading going across the top in purple. And they want the filters down the right. I am uh, trying to work against it and uh, get them to come around to my way of thinking that that's maybe not the best idea, but I'm still working on that. Because I think it takes away from the actual message of what I'm looking at. You see the colour straight away, you look at that straight away. So then in the middle, we've got the, you can see the net headcount drawn as levers. Very often, certainly in a lot of dashboards I've seen, you would normally just see a, a a bar chart of headcount uh, of joiners and a bar chart of levers underneath. So I thought, well, it's quite simple to just make a net calculation and put that in, and then you can instantly see when the company is increasing headcount or decreasing headcount. Below that, I've got active headcount by on a map. Now, I think everybody loves a map usually. They, they usually work. I would just be careful when using, because it, well, certainly in a, in a company like ours, we have a big presence in Switzerland, in America, and in usually Hong Kong, Singapore, Asia. So the map is obviously spread out to a lot of the full extent of the, the world. But I know most people that are going to be using this are going to be filtering down to a certain geographical region or team, and therefore the map's going to resize and it's going to be make it a lot more relevant. Now you see on the side we've got all the filters. Again, that's a, something that information one, this platform wanted us to have everything on the right hand side. I agree to, to a certain degree because it allows, it's, it makes it simple for everybody. Every time they go to a report, they know where the filters are. And actually it turned out that a lot of the feedback we got was, because in earlier iterations I'd had maybe the filters within the map or within the chart, you could click on that and it would filter the document. Well, people didn't like that actually. They actually preferred to see it on the right and then they know what they're actually clicking. But you can see I use a few icons there just to liven up the, the regions so they can click on the regional maps and then they'll, uh, it'll filter the document. So as you can see, there's lots of white space, hopefully. It's quite easy to read. Uh, fonts are con consistent and the color is used sparingly. There's one other useful feature which I, I can show on the next slide. So Within each of those six uh, metrics on the left, we then go into a detail on, on a further page, and I'll just show one of them. The first thing I have to mention, that the big white box now, that's the tooltip. And so when you put your mouse over the header on each page, it will give you the definitions for that page. So it's just quite a cool tip, I think. Instead of having an information icon or something that you could then maybe hover over that, I wanted to make it as clean as possible, so I used the, the header itself. So by putting the tooltip on the header, you get all the details. Now here we wanted to tell a bit more of a story around the data, and we've got the space to do that. So on the left, we've got the three, the three key metrics that we wanted to, to highlight. This is looking at levers. And then the first chart that I've got on the top is the, the line chart showing the history. So we want to see how the history is doing, where, how, how a lever is doing compared with the previous years. You can also filter that as well, or not filter, but you can change it to do a year to date, and then it'll just give you the graph just for the year to date. The next one along, which is now hidden by the, the, uh, the tooltip, is the drill by organization, but you can actually then drill down the organization to get the number of levers for the different levels of the organization. The middle section we chose to do, we do something specific to each topic, so levers is different to the joiners and vacancies and so on. But this one we chose to use the uh, lever reason. Um, just to, uh, to highlight, most of the data within this report is, 
is uh, non-sensitive data. But this was the only field that was sensitive to leave a reason. So if there's less than 10 records showing up, or if there's less than two reasons, then this box will actually be blank. And then at the bottom, you can see we've got a line by line. I've heard a lot of customer stories over the last two days as well. This is a, a general topic. People, it's difficult to get people away from line by lines. So we added in this little, we've only used maybe 10, 15 columns of the key, key uh, points of the data. So they can filter all on the right. It will filter that table below, the line by line below, and then they can just download that. So we're trying to slowly wean them off line by lines, obviously, but we give them the functionality in case they need it. But again, hopefully, plenty of white space, limited use of color, the two key things which I think are important. Now, we've had a lot of positive feedback from this. Uh, you can read some of them there. Uh, I, I guess some of the, the, the best feedback we've had is we've had teams come to us and say, can you help us design something like this? Uh, my manager even had one team come and say, well, they want to try and cut our budget so that we can't do anything further to make everybody else catch up before we can uh, do anything new. And I've just got one other thing to show around this one. Because uh, once you've got something like this, you need to obviously be able to market it so that people know that it's there, they can use it. And we did a lot of uh, presentations, going out to different teams, different regions, and teaching them how to use it. But at the same time, we also created a little video. So I'm going to quickly show you that. It's only it's about two minutes long, I think. To give you an idea of what is possible and, and ways of trying to market it. I couldn't get that music out of my head for a long time after that. So as I said, that was the, the key thing that I've done over the last, uh, well, the first thing that I did uh, since I joined uh, Swiss Re. Since then, I've worked on quite a few other uh, smaller dashboards, which I'll, I'll, I've got a few examples now. But we're working on the next ones. We're looking, working on a talent dashboard, on a, a diversity and an inclusion dashboard. So there's lots of, of things to come in the future. So this was another one I thought I could, uh, I could show for the visual design and also for the 
idea behind it. So this is a goals report. So this is when you have to fill out your goals at the beginning of a year. Uh, it's usually around March, April. That's when the, the focus is on this topic. And you've got to fill out your business and your development goals. Now, the process within our company is that the HR business partners would then go out to the business and, and look at these numbers and say maybe people need to fill out more or less or whatever. And so you've got maybe 20, 25 people downloading this report on a daily basis, not this one, but the actual line by line from the source system, and then creating whatever they do 25 different times. So I thought it's quite easy, an easy win to be able to download it once, save it to a location. I can get Tableau to read that location and then automatically schedule it, so it's, it's pretty much automated. And then instead of having 25 different versions of something in Excel, I can make something visual where it's quite easy to, to see the, the focus of the data. So you can see in the table, and again, I've had to highlight, uh, uh, blur out some of, the, some of the names or the numbers, but you can see it's split out by the table on the, on the left. It's split out by the division and by the, the band. So ABCD is like a rank or band within the company. We then show it by the average number of, of uh, goals by, by band again, whether it's business or development goals. And on the right hand side, we've got these less than three, more than seven and zero goals. So the idea being maybe you need to, the less than three is maybe too little, more than seven is maybe too many. And for the zero ones, you maybe need to kick them. And the idea being if you, if you click on this, actually on the, the actual version, if you click on those three circles, it brings up a line by line at the bottom right with the email address so you can actually contact them. The same with the bottom left table. They're the people that you really need to maybe focus on, the zero, the people that have entered nothing. And that just breaks it out by the organization. And again, you can click on that and it'll give you the line by line. But from a design perspective, plenty of white space, limited use of color, uh, standard look and feel, which is what we're always trying to promote to make sure that people get trust within our data as well. So I've got one more example, and this was a, it came from a question that, so the head of Corso wanted to speak with HR about the organization. Corso is a corporate solutions, it's one of the divisions within Swiss Re. And so the head of HR came to me and said, well, how can we do this? And I'd seen this before from a guy called Geoffrey Schaefer, and I'd always wanted to do it. So I thought, oh, it's perfect time, I'll, I'll try and build it. So I did think it while I was doing it, it's maybe not right. But I built it anyway, just to see if I could do it. And it does actually work, I've just hidden the name. So the idea being, you've got the, the, the head guy at the top, you then see the direct reports, and for each one you see the direct reports. And if you click on it, the version I've got at work, it will then go to our internet site and it'll pick out that type of information on the top right. So that's obviously me. But for each one, it would bring back the relevant data. But that's only going to three levels, and we needed to go to about five or six levels. And as you can see, I couldn't put names on top of that. It would have been just a mess. So at the same time, as nice as it looks, it's maybe not going to answer the question that they really want. So I didn't use it in the end. I used this, which took me five minutes to create but it was much simpler and it answered the question that they wanted. So it's just a quick uh, table of the, the organization. You can see that going across the top, department, division, and so on. You see the team name, and you actually see the manager name. And the bar chart is just saying how many direct reports. Now they can quickly go into that. They can click on any one of these levels of the organization, and it will filter just for that part of the organization. So then. They can, uh, the head of HR could go to the organization and actually discuss the different teams. They all are focused on people, so they know the heads of each team, and then they can see maybe if there's a team that needs to be merged and so on. So that was a much more practical solution for the problem, even though that obviously looks a lot nicer. So there are the three... Uh, examples that I've got and as I said that's uh, it's one of my favorite topics how do you actually design it and how do you make it look nice and attractive so uh, 
people can understand the data. The next point that I want to go through, the second part, is training. So how do we actually train our team within Swiss Re? Now, I should have maybe switched this the other way around. I want to talk about community first. Now, obviously, you, you've all been here the last two days. They have a fantastic community spirit within Tableau. You can see it's much like a party and uh, plenty of people there to help. And I used to work at, as I said, UBS. And we had a guy there called Paul Benoob, who's sat in the front row. And uh, he had a fantastic service at Swiss Re, uh, at UBS, sorry. So he had this uh, center of excellence, I think it's called, where they really did everything. They had specialists on hand that would actually, similar to the doctor sessions, you could phone up, you could book a session, they would help you with any problem that you had. They would constantly blog, telling new ideas, uh, where to look for certain types of issues, or if you've got this issue, what to do. They would encourage people to ask questions all the time. They would monitor the servers. They would get back to you if they saw something, uh, if there was an issue. They would even reach out to people when they'd seen dashboards on the, on the server and try and help them improve their dashboard servers. It was a phenomenal service to see from an IT department, which you don't often see, I don't think. And I think that's important when you're talking about training to try and build up that kind of uh, team or, or that kind of uh, community if you want to actually encourage people to learn and to keep on learning. It's one thing to actually start it and get them motivated. To actually keep them motivated is difficult. And this is one of the key ways of doing it, I think. We're not there yet, Swiss Re, in doing that. We are working on it, uh, but it takes time. So then if you look on the, the left-hand side, so how did I actually go about training our team? So one of the key reasons I joined was to actually also help train our team. And I was thinking, I mean, I, I basically picked up Tableau myself, I looked at the videos, and that's the way I, I found easiest to learn. But not everybody learns the same. But some things I think are quite important when, you, when you're talking about learning. I think one is that the data should be relevant. So as good as the super slow database is, it's not really relevant to our business. People don't understand that data. It's much easier if you can do something with your own data. And the second part is it should be interactive. It should be something that they can use, they can go back to. And so I built something in Tableau. And you can see the little icon there with a little picture. But I may as well just go to it because this one is live. So I built this in, in Tableau as a way of trying to help people, or to, the way that I was going to present training. So the lollipop chart at the bottom is just the time scale. The first one is what I'm going to teach in the first week, second week, and so on as you go through. Now I'm happy to share this with anybody. I've actually got a copy which I can just send out. Uh, there's nothing sensitive in it, there's nothing Swiss, there's one Swiss Re specific on this slide, but in the one, the other copy, there's nothing. But as you can see, these are the topics that I thought were the, the most relevant to learn in this particular order. So I've got, the first one is basics, Tableau interface, I've always put a task there, and I put a link to the video. So the video actually goes to the Tableau uh, training session on this, on this. So they can, they've got a combination of all three. I actually went through it within, so go back a minute. So I, I then decided I'll do two hours a week training for the whole team. The team is split out throughout the world. So we've got people in, in India, in Bratislava, in America, in Switzerland. So unfortunately, I couldn't travel to everyone each week. So we do it on Skype and we have a two hour session. And each week I go through maybe one or two of these, these lollipops. Every time I go through it, I build an extra worksheet where I'm, I'm doing whatever the topic is, and then I'll, I'll label a worksheet accordingly. So you can see a few more. We've got joining data, metadata, uh, data management. So I've been through all these different topics. And this is live. I can just keep on adding to it as we go through more difficult topics. And I built in a few uh, groupings. These are just groupings at the top. So this is basics. And then you can highlight 
as you can see, it highlights those that are related to that topic. We've got visual analytics, chart types, and data fans. And as I said, it's to, there's a simple Excel sheet behind it which does all this, which I can just update as needed. Now, after doing that for a few weeks, I got some feedback that maybe two hours is too long. It's certainly too long for me to talk. Two hours, I'm not used to that, and I don't particularly like it. So it was good feedback, and after that, I moved then to maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes talking, and then I would give the rest of the time for questions and to actually enable them to do the task within that time period as well, which also helped. And one of the experiences I found is that very often on the call, people won't ask questions on the call. I don't know if it's because they think they've got a daft question, but it's far easier if I just log off and then I'm get, I get flooded with, with phone calls. So it certainly works to a, or it certainly works in our case, not to ask questions on, on the call itself. And then they've got the rest of that time, the extra hour, hour 20 minutes, to do the tasks that I've set and then I, tr I don't try and enforce, I don't want to enforce it, but I try and enforce, well not enforce them, I try and ask them politely to do it, just so that I know that they've understood it, the topic, and that they're, they're going to be able to use it in the future. So that's basically my talk. Uh, that's how I go about training uh, our team. I've been doing that now for six months, I think. We've gone through this and we're, we're, we're doing a few other topics as well on the, the, the one that I've got. And as I said, any, I'm happy to share this with anybody that wants it. Uh, I find it quite a useful way of, of tracking what we've done. It's also useful for them. They can go back, they can open this whenever they want and see how we built something. So I'm happy to take any questions if you've got any. Hi, um, my first question is about the dashboard that you showed earlier on. I just wanted to know, did you fix the size of the dashboard or was it set to automatic? Because it looks really good and um, my problem with creating a dashboard is I always use a fixed I always dimension fix. as well. Okay, so it's fixed. It's fixed. Yeah. Okay. How will you load the data? How the data is connected? Like, what's the source data for the for the for the HR dashboard? Yeah. So we have a, a central data warehouse where we load all the data, and that is also fairly new. It's probably within the last year, year and a half. And so we've got our source system, which is uh, Success Factors. We download the data on a daily basis, and it gets loaded into our data warehouse. It's now automatic. Yes. We're still working. The next iterations are going to be to include recruitment data, uh, learning data, time management data. So we've still got quite a few systems to incorporate within the data warehouse. But the basic uh, data that we get from our core HR system is, is automated. Uh, I had a question about the training. Um, one was how many people are you training at the moment? Like what's so the team roughly ballpark? The team is 11, but we also have a few people from other teams that have okay. joined, so it's about 15 people at the moment. Okay. And then um, when do you expect to revisit some of the training topics at a later point, and how often do you think you need to kind of go through the whole cycle? Because that can be a drag after a while. Yeah, yeah it can. And I do see that there's always... I find two types of people. The people that pick it up quickly, they want to learn it, and they'll go ahead and learn it, and it's quite easy to work with those. There's the other side where it's maybe a bit trickier. They're not using it on a daily basis, and so it's very hard to pick it up when you're not using it constantly. And that is a case where you sometimes you have to just sit next to them one by one and go through it and, and go through examples that are relevant to them. And It does take time. There's no easy way, but I will probably have to go through it again with some people, yeah. I actually meant also with new employees coming on onboarding and oh, new there's people. new people you need to start training again and restart the cycle, I guess. Well, in, in that sense, we don't hire that often at the moment because of uh, current uh, restrictions. But uh, in case we do get new people, and I'm, I'm more than happy to, to take them through it. Yeah. Like, 
so in the role, uh, the, I understand there's like a unique role for a developer, like dashboard developer, and at the same time Tableau trainer. How many people are there in your organization that have this role, let's say? Is just you or there are more? Like I mean, I, I'm specific to HR, so I'm working within HR and I, mm -hmm. I, I do that there. There's nobody else in HR that does so that. So just one person for whole HR for both building dashboards and training, yes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I would have two questions. First of all, uh, do you have any strategy behind usage metrics? So depending on how the dashboard is used to take different actions? And if yes, what? So do I have any... Sorry, I mean, you? let's say you deployed this dashboard, users using it, you measure how many users using it, and depending oh, okay. on if they are using it or not, you take different actions. And if yes, okay. you could show so what actions. As I said, this is, was released, our first key Tableau report that we released, and it's actually been the most successful. Uh, there's several thousand hits per month on it. So it is getting used, and we do then take the feedback, uh, mainly from word of mouth, what people are asking for, and then we try and incorporate that into new releases of what people are asking for. But we don't do anything on the fly. We don't, based on, on the number of, of hits, we don't then automatically do something. Okay, so my second question is related to what you have just said. I mean, um, how do you collect the feedback and work with the feedback? We do that by uh, surveys. So we've been out and we've actually surveyed different teams to say how are you using it, how would you like, is there anything you would like better or different, and so on. So surveys okay. is the way. Yeah. Just um, like because the HR data is very sensitive, I'm just wondering like whether access rights are uh, managed on Tableau uh, on the Tableau uh, site, or rather somewhere it's like with some I don't know IDM roles. How yep. do you manage access rights to the data? There's two ways. Uh, so this one is is on information one. As I said, this is the a, a platform within Swishree for loading all of our key key uh, dashboards. If it goes onto information one, then the access is, is done in the database. So only certain people that have access to HR will be able to see it. We do also have our own Tableau server, which is where we've posted some of these reports. And in that case, then we do it manually. So there's only a handful of people or maybe 20 people that are using this. So then we control that manually ourselves on Tableau server and we say if you can have access or not. Do you have a particular tool you use to make the color palettes? Sorry? The color palettes that you were talking about okay, before. Yeah. Do you have a tool that you use? No, no, these are the, these are the standard Swiss Re colors. They're not my choice. But uh, yeah, there's about seven key colors within Swiss Re. I don't think any of them go together, but that's our colors. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I want to know if you're specifically hired for HR reporting, because usually it's very hard to convince HR that BI can do anything. Oh, that's true. It's, it has been, uh, the good thing is we have a management in place that actually believe in it and, and want it. So they want to move to this data-driven organization, and, and that makes a world of difference. When, when the management believe it, then it makes it a lot easier to sell it to the rest of the organization. Uh, but it is true, working with some people, trying to get them more into this idea of, of seeing data and actually being able to see uh, what it is you're trying to, to do can be a challenge. But as I said, I think the key thing is our management believe in it, they want it, and that makes a world of difference. It makes it a lot easier. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, your uh, little marketing video is quite an interesting concept. Would you recommend that's uh, a very good idea for any big dashboard launch like this? Would you do it again? Uh, I'd do it again for the, for the big ones, yeah. Not for the smaller ones like this or something. But if it's going out to a wider audience, then definitely. Because it, as you can see, it shows all the key features of, of Tableau that you can subscribe, that you can download. All these other functions, it just allows people to see it within two minutes and they can get an idea of, instead of phoning me up and saying, can I do this or this, they can see it straight away whether or not they can do it or not. So I would recommend it and it's a good way of marketing it, I guess. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 
Uh, Paul, you mentioned that you have like quite a, let's say, few thousand, thousand views per month, so quite impressive. I would like to ask you about uh, customer trainings. What about that? Do you provide any regular trainings for your customers or deliver them different materials in form of videos, PDF or whatever? Or so how it works? When we went live with this one, we actually did quite a lot of customer training. Personally, I think Tableau is quite intuitive, so I would just say go and play with it. You can't break it, so go and play with it. But uh, we did do a lot of training, so we actually took people through every single action, all the filters, what you can do and what you can't do, and it did actually help a lot. Uh, it helps my understanding of, of what other people think of Tableau, so it does actually it does help a lot. And we, we did that in the first instance. We're probably going to have to do it again at some point just to ensure that people are still using it, uh, they're still motivated and still understand that. And obviously for new joiners, it would help them as well. Cool, thanks. I think there's one more. Uh -huh. Sorry, I've got a couple of technical questions. Okay. Um, and I'm quite happy if we want to answer them afterwards or something. Um, so the two questions that I've got is um, how many, so on your dashboards, how many different data sources whilst you might be coming from the same data warehouse, how many different data source connections are you running to kind of build out your dashboard? Uh, with this one, I think there's maybe three. We've got one for the, the majority of the data is kept within the key HR system, so that's the majority of it. We've got external staff, you can see down there at the bottom, that comes from a different source. Mm -hmm. And we've got, I think, vacancies comes from another one. So those three are the key ones, but they're all stored within the data warehouse. Okay, um, and the second question, and this is one that I've been um, having a major challenge with, is how are you calculating attrition? Like, what's your data structure like that helps you calculate attrition? Oh, is there? I mean, I know how to calculate attrition, but in terms of doing it in Tableau, in terms of picking that um, point in time um, to refer back to it and then calculating that to... So we use an average headcount when we're doing that. We use an average headcount over 12 months, and then we work it out based off of that. But I can show you the calculation yeah, uh, later if you need to. Yeah. That would be great. Sorry, I, I just have one question on, so you said that you have uh, SAP success factors as the core HR system. And so is there any core HR system such as Salesforce, or not Salesforce, um, Workday, or success factors that can do this natively without having to create the data warehouse? I'm no expert, but I've never found one yet that does it. And the, the one that we used to have at UBS, that certainly didn't do it either. I think most systems like that, they're built for the users, for actually entering data. They're not built for the getting data out of it. I think, personally, it's the wrong way of designing a piece of software. But uh, I haven't found a, a, a tool yet that is actually as good as what you can do in Tableau. Thank you. Do you do any follow-up after training? So how do you make sure that uh, Tableau users are using Tableau and adding value to the business? That's a good question. Uh, going back to them, asking them, doing surveys and actually making sure that they're actually using it. Phoning them up, getting feedback from them. So I speak regularly with uh, the head of Corso for HR. We've got other members of the team that do the same with other parts of the organization. And it's just getting their feedback. Uh, okay, so you so you just gather the feedback by the forums by word of mouth, and okay. what, and so far we've done one survey on this as well to get more uh, constructive feedback and more on a on a form basis. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I have two questions that may be connected together. How many people are using this dashboard and how you gather the requirements for... So how many people are using it? They are using, are the customers of that? See. I don't know exactly, but I think it's in the few hundred, I think. Okay, and how do you gather the requirements for, uh, for those? Uh, again, we went out to the key uh, HR leaders of the organization, so there's, there's three that we, we look at. We got their feedback. We looked at what the source system was providing in the first place, which wasn't much, it was just line by lines. 
and then the rest is our experience, what we, we know people are asking for, what they're generally opening tickets for, and then that's how we, we designed it in the first place. We went out then uh, in the very beginning with kind of a, a demo version, and then based on that we got a bit more feedback, and then we changed a few things, and then we went out live. Thank you. How often your customers would like to print the reports? How you're dealing with those requests? <laughs> I'm quite surprised that since we've gone to this, people are printing less. They still want the line lines, but they are printing it a lot less. Yeah, that's the common problem with the scroll bars. If you have scroll bars, they usually complain that exactly. they cannot print. Yep. Yeah. But I think it is part of the organization that we're trying to move away from this old idea of printing everything, PDF in it, and I'll put it in PowerPoint and get them to actually use the, the laptops, the iPads or whatever, and actually use it online. It will take time. It, it, certainly we're not, we're not there, but uh, slowly we're getting there. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, it's uh, not so much a question. Well, thanks very much for the kind words about the service, and uh, I really wish you hadn't left UBS. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so, well, thank you very much, and that's uh, yeah, finished. <laughs>